Patricia, lovely to meet you finally. Uh, we were, we, we should have met each other about maybe just over a year ago now because you unveiled this gorgeous statue in London. Uh, I, and and we, I was trying to get on there. Not a brilliantly beautiful weather day. I do remember for you. But tell me your memories of that. What was it like when you came over for that? Well, I, I made several trips over f uh, in the process of creating the statue. It was a, and a, I have to say the team was terrific. And I was really, I, I was a pain in the neck for them because <laughs> I was insisting on every single detail being right. And I figure if you're making a statue of Gene Kelly, the man who insisted on every detail being right, that you had to make sure that his foot is in a perfect you know, it's his toes are bent, it's in a ballet position, the little scar that he got when he fell off of his velocipede is, is there. <laughs> and the, even the final thing that went in was the sparkle in his eye uh, yeah. that they had, didn't have that and they put it put it in. And so it was February 27th, it will stay in my mind forever. <laughs> and it was snowing, yes. it was snowing and, and it was, it was, pouring rain when we unveiled Jean first thing in the morning and then by the time they got to Paddington Bear I felt so sorry for them because it had started to snow but it was several um, speaking of gorgeous young men several gorgeous young men and very talented men from Bird College came over and did a, a wonderful tribute to Jean a kind of their own version of singing in the rain yes. and, and and then unveiled it and it it was magical and i think and that evening uh they they had kind of a statue tour and uh, he just looked glorious there and he really is he's really beautiful and i'm very very happy with him and i think i've gotten so many photographs from people of, I flew back on the 29th of February and then the world shut down yeah. and but right before I, I got a lot of photographs of people doing exactly what we imagined they would do which is they jumped up on the lamppost yeah. and they're swinging off of it and we actually uh, talked about it and had to reinforce the statue knowing that people would be doing that so I think when things open up over there again um, you'll be able to you'll see lots and lots of people uh, around it. He, he just, he just brings joy. And I think especially now that's a very helpful thing. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I love on your social media sites, you uh, print up these gorgeous pictures of the wonderful Mr. Kelly and lots I've never seen, which is brilliant as well. But I love your, your words, um, you know, Patricia, because you, you're really good at writing, I have to say, and you bring it to life. And one of the things that struck me the other day was you said, um, oh, you know, Jean, um, you know, w didn't like to do close-ups because, you know, whatever, you know, like men are, you know. But I've always thought that he looked very modern, even in the 40s, you know, facially he looked, like he could be today you know there are certain stars that look um like in an era i can't explain it really but rita hayworth looks 1940s do you know what i mean gene right, didn't right. no i think you're you're really on to something not only in his facial features um uh, where he looks very contemporary but also in his dress because yeah. wearing and he's wearing his own clothes. This is what he yeah. wore around the house. Unless he's doing a costume picture like Three Musketeers, he's in khakis and uh, a sweater and a scarf and a cap. And I, I do a lot of speaking around the world in schools and kids always say, he looks so cool. He looks like he just stepped out of a, a J. Crew catalog or something. And I think that that, I, he, I mean, there's a great thing about representing Gene's legacy because he is so contemporary and he doesn't have that dated look and I think his movement is also uh, extremely contemporary I mean it it didn't go away it didn't get replaced yes. it's still yeah. go to thing for choreographers and dancers all the strictly dancers and yeah. uh it's uh, so it's he's he's really I think very unique in that position of what you're describing. Do you know what's interesting? I think I first noticed it. I'm sure lots of people did of my era. Dancing with, of course, not the greats like Judy Garland and Frank Sinatra, but Tom and Jerry. I, I think I was introduced to him through that because you know we 
tended to watch, when you're young, you watch cartoons, don't you? And I was fascinated as to how they did it uh, in that era, you know? Um, and that was a very uh, forward-thinking idea because it does keep going through generation to generation. Even today, people probably learn about Gene Kelly from Tom and Jerry, dare I say. <laughs> They do. I mean, it's a great introduction. And as you said, it's just, it was so radical. And so and people forget, I mean, it, that movie came out in 1945 and people had experimented with live action and animation, but never taken it to that uh, degree where you would have the dancing. And it was so difficult to do. <laughs> and Gene said that the camera operator got a, an ulcer doing it because there, only Gene knew where that mouse was and uh, the mouse had to be drawn in. There are, it, just in a, a very short segment in a, in a, uh, a few, there's like 3000 individual drawings of the mouse and they're done. If you look very closely, sometimes he's a little taller, sometimes he's a little fatter. Yeah. They're all done by different people, but it's so charming and um, really beguiling because he he manages to convince you with his looks and things that there's that, that the mouse is there and then <laughs> and then you see the mouse. But it's I you run I run that um, in my shows and the minute that comes on, it's just people go crazy with that. It just cheers you up. Don't, it doesn't matter when you watch it. It just cheers you up. One of the people I was lucky enough to meet was the late great uh, Frank Sinatra Jr. And he told me this wonderful story about Gene Kelly that his dad, of course, Frank, um, you know, basically just taught, Gene taught Frank how to dance, how to move on camera, you know. Uh, and um, I would have imagined that must have been maybe only Gene Kelly because he was quite, shall we say, tough as a person. So he wouldn't be frightened of Frank, would he? You know, I would imagine a few people would be frightened. No, they were, and in fact, uh, they were very close. As Gene said, they were closer than brothers and uh, they were uh, they were both the kind of the little bad boys. They were the, the, the kids that kind of came from the other side of the tracks yeah. and bonded with each other. And Gene, uh, Gene was not really, uh, Gene, people describe him as tough, but he was, he was very tender. I mean, he was, he was very kind and generous. And he said it was easy to teach someone like Frank Sinatra because he had taught so many children in his dancing school and he knew exactly how how you could elicit the movement from somebody and he said frank really came in and trained like a prize fighter he really was dedicated and and that's a different side of frank sinatra too that yeah. he was not difficult with gene and the only thing that frank had a hard time with is, is the how slow movie making is and he, he he wanted it to get over, you know. Finish the, There's so much time waiting between takes while they relight things, and he he was impatient with that. But it was very very dear, and and Gene always choreographed to the partner, so it was very important to him that you make the other person look their best. So yeah. he created the dance that the other person could do, and so he, he didn't do it to make himself look the best he made the partner look the best and I think that's that's why Frank looks terrific when he dances with Gene. Do you know what's lovely about that as well is as you say a lot of people don't see that but he was clever to note that as a as a twosome if you like a duo it lives on you know because if you just have one person that you like you think oh I'm not watching that because he's not very good but to have both of them being brilliant you know they are but I mean I'm in awe of people who can dance because I was lucky enough again to, to interview uh, the late Debbie Reynolds and she told me this wonderful story you know Patricia that um, Jean was in Mr. Louis B. Mayer's office right and uh, she'd been called by Louis B. and she'd just been signed you know very young come from Warner's hadn't done much or anything and said um, Louis B. Mayer said Jean this is your dancing partner and she said to, apparently to Louis, but Mr. Mayor, I can't dance. And then she said she could feel the color draining out of Gene Kelly's face, you know, because she thought, oh no, you know. And eventually he said, you'll dance. 
And Jean taught her how, not just to dance, but how to move like a lady. She said, sit like a lady, be graceful. And I thought, what a lovely thing to learn from someone like that. Not just the dancing, but the whole how to present yourself, you know. And she was a very lovely lady, actually. But she said it was a tough gig. Did, did, were those your, you know, was that what you were told yourself? Well, I, and I have to, I have to, uh, Debbie was a, a friend and, and, but she, she never told the truth. And so that, <laughs> the, unfortunately, that's, that's quite a, she had a lot of stories that she told. And that is one of them because uh, L.B. Mayer wasn't even the head of the studio at the time. And, and he wasn't the one who uh, brought uh, Jean and uh, Debbie together. And in fact, uh, it was the producer, Arthur Freed, who called Gene up yeah. to his office and showed Gene a little bit of uh, Debbie singing Abba Dabba Woo Woo. And Gene thought she was perfect for the role. And uh, and then when they learned that, that she could not dance, he said, that's no problem, because he knew he could teach her easily. And and the toughness of Jean, actually, she worked with his assistants primarily. And but Jean had a, a precision. I mean, you had to. I think any dancer or choreographer understands that. If you don't hit your mark, and the camera doesn't hit its mark, then yeah. it, it's you have to do it again. And it's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. And so uh, Jean said that it was she didn't really understand that they were making her a star that they were she she would get tired and want to just go home and go back to the valley and it'd be an hour and a half of rehearsing and she, and she had no idea that as a dancer you're on your feet eight hours a day i mean that it's a it's a very rigorous thing but she did a fantastic job and she was perfect for the role and and so um but she tells she doesn't you can't believe anything she says and she does it in such a convincing way but you know, it's I'm glad you said that because there were elements that um you know I spent quite a few times with her and stories would evolve that you think I've never heard that before you know what I mean but you know they're sitting opposite you Patricia and they are they are who they are <laughs> you know and who are you to question that when you're sitting there you know you're like hmm okay <laughs> but you yeah, know, she, and it's <laughs> it's exactly and it's it's funny as evolve is a perfect word for it because they did evolve and if yes. you if you watch over the years in the interviews it evolves and and at points she was extremely gracious and and did acknowledge that he made her a star and and that and and as i say that that friendship continued uh, till the day jean died so but but it's a shtick, and and yeah. uh, Donald O'Connor did the same thing. He had all these uh, stories, and you know these are performers. You have to remember these are these are actors. These are yeah. people. I think what distinguished Gene in my interviewing him and recording him every day for almost ten years was that Gene was directing, choreographing, and starring in the movies, and so he's. He has to watch the schedule, the budget, and I, I think he didn't have the tendency to kind of tell the stories as stories and exaggerate. He just, mm. he remembered uh, when I asked him how long it took him to shoot this, this iconic singing in the rain sequence, he said a day and a half. And so to kind of check him, I went to the uh, Arthur Freed collection that's at the University of Southern California here, and the production notes are there. And sure enough, it was a day and a half. And yeah. so I think he had a different perspective on it. He didn't really have to. <laughs> what always kind of amazed me was that these things were so extraordinary that, that as you're saying with Jerry the Mouse and these things, you don't really need to embellish them. I mean, yeah. the, the making of these things, it, it's extraordinary enough. But I think I think some of these, um, the performers got with audiences and, and it's, you know, the stories evolve. So. Do you know, I love you, Patricia, because you think like me, you know, I've sat with people like um, Tony Curtis and Mickey Rooney, and you can almost see their brains cogging, you know, like, this sounds a better story, you know, and you're thinking, Marilyn Monroe said what? You know, so it's kind of like, I don't think so. One star that we all love and that Gene appeared with, and, and I just think they were a great pairing, of course, uh, was the, I mean, it just 
multi-talented Judy Garland. And, you know, I've been lucky enough again to meet Liza and, and Lorna and people like that, even Joey, in fact. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realise what a fun person Judy Garland was, you know? She had a, gr a great sense of humour. There's always the negative side of the story, isn't there, you know? What, what was Jean like? What did Jean think about Judy? Oh, he loved her. I mean, he really loved Judy Garland and and he always credited her with his career because it was Judy who really guided him through his first picture for me and my gal because yeah. the director Busby Berkeley didn't want Jean in the picture and he made that very clear. It was very cold um, on the set and ultimately they became good friends but initially he he just gene said he wouldn't give him the time of day and so it was really judy who told gene uh, about the camera and about how you even sit in a chair because you don't it's very different from being on stage and gene had been on the broadway stage yeah. and everything was different and she would teach him how you kind of crouch in under the camera and and i think uh that was just essential for Jean and she, he said she was the brightest woman in Hollywood and he also said she was the sexiest woman which I think is wonderful because so often she's described as I mean literally in the newspapers she was described as an ugly duckling and um, but she had a, a quality and humor is exactly uh, Jean said she just would laugh and uh, and I think that that in the stories that you see of her, the biopics and things, uh, that's missing. You get this kind of, it's like watching a a, a car wreck or something. Yeah, and I think yeah. I think it really does a disservice to her because I think I always describe people like Judy and Frank Sinatra and Jean. I mean, these are really these are comets. You know, these are these are things that fly through our life once mm -hmm. and. There, there's nothing like Judy Garland. There's no, there will never be another Judy Garland. There's not, to have that composition of the, the voice and that vulnerability and that strength and power, that mixture. I, and I don't think, I don't think people outside of that get it. You know, they, yeah. they kind of, they tend to go to one side or the other. And but Jean adored her, and I think you can, when you watch them in film. The chemistry is palpable and the sense of humor there a lot of times they're kind of breaking up with each other and it's very fun to watch but there's also this tremendous power of of affection you can see that and and probably in a lot of the stills i've been posting too you can yeah. see that on that's what i say i love about what you post and i love the you know the words underneath it just brings everything to life because you know the stories do you know what i mean so it's great it's like reading a book every day i, think, I wonder what you're going to put today you know that sort of thing <laughs> tell me when you first met gene yourself the very first meeting um when i have always met these big big stars you do have that tummy moment don't you where you think oh you know because they are uh, they're, they're come to life in front of you, you know what I mean? It's like, you've only seen them 40 foot high on the screen and then they're sitting there and you think, I am a little bit nervous. <laughs> Were you nervous meeting Gene Kelly for the first time? Well, uh, it's hard for me to it's even acknowledge it. It just doesn't even seem possible, but I did not know who Gene Kelly was when I first <laughs> met him. So I, I, um, I was a very nerdy Herman Melville scholar, the American writer and I, so instead of being in the movie theaters, I was in a library with my nose in a book. And so I, and I was writing a television special about the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC. And I, I heard uh, on the set that this someone named Gene Kelly was going to be the host narrator. And I didn't know if that was a man or a woman. I had no <laughs> idea. And we met passing I was going into the ladies' room. At, it was midnight at the Air and Space Museum, and I was going into the ladies' room, and he was coming out of the men's room, and and uh, he he said hello to me, and I, I actually saluted and said, "Hey, how you doing?" And I mean, I was I had no clue who this person was, and the director, all the women were scratching at the door to get at Gene because he was uh, the mo one of the most eligible bachelors in the world at the time, and. 
So they all thought they could get a marriage proposal out of him by the end. <laughs> Which is what we were saying earlier on. Today, you could at least Google that person. But in that era, yeah. you just, sure. you've got, I've done the same. You've got no sure. idea. You think, well, what? who is this person? You know? Years later, you find yeah. out that it's like a Rockefeller or something. You go, oh. <laughs> I know. I was just so, I mean, it, it turned out it was the perfect way to meet him because I didn't come with any preconceived notions. Yeah. I didn't come thinking I, I mean now i people think he is the guy on the screen which is so interesting they'll ask me they'll say does he ever do any acting I'm thinking, what do you think he's doing up there is <laughs> that's not he didn't dance around the the kitchen at home you know this is he's a very different he's playing a role but um we really bonded over i, I mean i spent the week with him and didn't know he was famous. I mean, that tells you a little bit about uh, about my knowledge at that point. But I, I, we bonded over words because he he spoke French, he spoke Italian, he read Latin, he spoke Yiddish. He very often read a book a day. He was just the, really the true Renaissance gentleman, and and he wrote poetry and he read poetry. And we just started playing word games and quoting poetry back and forth and. By the middle of the week, I was completely enchanted, but I, I didn't know he was famous until after he'd left. Um, somebody told me he was very famous and I should go down to the video store and check <laughs> it out. And I did it. I was just like, oh, my God, <laughs> how did I you know, come back with 48 movies? And I think, how did I miss this major part of the 20th century? But I, I think really the fact that he was a blank slate to me was was really... I, I came and I he then gave me the story and but it is interesting because I didn't grow up with that fascination. I met a lot of these celebrities with Gene and what was interesting is that very few of them are actually very interesting yes. off camera. Yeah. You know, they're not yeah. the they're not the most interesting dinner guest or yeah. the um, or the brightest. Uh, they're they look terrific on the screen, but they're not not that interesting but um, who was the Jean one was... though sorry patricia who was the one that you met when you were with gene that you couldn't quite believe you know like when you you suddenly thought i'm now meeting x person i can't believe this who made an impression on you well you know who made an impression on me was and for a different a different reason i i, I went to gene's uh publicist had a, a party for Paul Newman and Elizabeth Taylor, and uh, we, I, we walked in, and at the piano, Henry Mancini and Paul Newman were playing, sitting together, playing improv piano, and I just, it was the most <laughs> astonishing thing to see, and, uh, and what was interesting is that Paul Newman was the only person who remembered my name, because usually in, if you're the the wife of, or the, um, you know, a celebrity wife is pretty low on the totem pole. And, <clears throat> and it was very interesting because a lot of people would just call me love. Oh, hello, love. Because they don't, they <laughs> never remember who you are. And uh, Paul Newman ca caught, when he said good night, he said uh, my name. And so I, I thought that was real class. I would say, um, the classiest people, Billy Crystal was actually watching Billy Crystal with Gene was uh, he he had just tremendous respect and and it was it was very touching to watch that. So um, I would probably I would it was the um, people like Sinatra who who was more of a buddy. So I wasn't really in awe of Frank. I yeah. was. He was so he was so tender and so kind and he, um, really helpful to me at the end of Gene's life and I think showed a side that that most people just don't see very often and so he I was never overwhelmed by him I just he was just very very kind. Do you know it's, it's, it's as I say it's lovely listening to you because then you think you're not alone when you don't you know when you're with these people you do somehow think. 
Mm, you are created. Many of them are created. And we forget that, don't we, Patricia? You know, that you, you sit in his open it like a Lana Turner or something. You think, beautiful, but created. <laughs> you know, so exactly. a different sort of person. I, I must ask you, one of my, uh, I suppose, I was very aware of Gene Kelly growing up, as everybody was, but I would loved it when he came back into Vogue, if you like, through Xanadu. Um, because that was, you know, that band was a big, you know, thing. Everybody was in love with Olivia Newton-John. I was, I've been lucky enough to meet Olivia, and she was in love with Jean, right? Just to let you know. And yeah. um, she said he was the loveliest person. She couldn't quite believe that Olivia Newton-John was dancing and being trained by Gene Kelly. Um, did he like that experience with Xanadu? Because it was. I loved it. Even now I watch it and still find it an incredibly clever film. It was a bit ahead of its time, I think. Uh, I just saw Olivia in February in, in Australia when I, I did my tour there. And I love Olivia. She's, talk about gracious. She's just always been very gracious about working with Jean. And I, I really appreciate that because it's just... Um, it it's, means a lot and she's just very kind about it and it was uh about xanadu uh gene said um it was the only time he worked on a film where absolutely no one knew what they were doing and uh <laughs> it it was um what's interesting about it i i hate to even tell tell the, his truth about it because so many people love the movie yeah. and so many people were introduced to Gene through it. And so it kind of started this new generation who then went to explore who he was and saw the rest of his films. So, but Gene, Gene was furious because when he, he and Olivia showed up, there was no script. There was nobody. It was just total chaos. And Gene is a, is a man who grew up in the depression in the, the United States um, and whose family you know, suffered for that. His father lost his job. Gene, to, if you waste money, that was almost, that was a cardinal sin um, to, to take, waste hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And uh, the number with Gene and Olivia was not in the movie uh, originally and when they did the preview for it uh, the cards came back and everybody said they said where's the number with gene and olivia they had neglected to shoot one and so they'd already closed the set everything was done and they tried to call gene and, and he wouldn't take their phone calls gene had a gene would go very very far with people but if you kind of crossed a line then then he that was it. Yeah. And finally, uh, finally, he did uh, take a call and he said, OK, I'll come in on one condition that it's a closed set and the director and producers are nowhere near it. And I'll I'll create it. And the cameraman and the camera operator will be there and Olivia. So that when you see the two of them do the duet together, mm -hmm. it's it's very different from the rest of the film. And it is. Yeah, I think very touching because yeah. and again he choreographed to her because she wasn't a dancer but he makes her look uh, beautiful in that so. yeah well thank that, you thank you for that i love that i just you're so right you know patricia because it does you can see something's gone on in the film because you think this is class and the other things you think wonder what olivia thought well i know what she thought she told me about you wonder what she thought with some of the script you know like you think what does this mean you know um, but i think the music carried along um the electric light orchestra had you know brilliant music jeff lynn was a genius i thought and i think for my generation um, when we went to see, we weren't that bothered too much about plot lines, <laughs> you know. She was just lovely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, she's she's gorgeous, and she's just and she she doesn't change one iota. And I think, I mean, obviously the album did very very well. Yeah. And Gene roller skated. I mean, this is 1980, and he did all of his own roller skating in it. He was he was angry because at one point they cut off his legs, so it looks like it could be a stand-in for that. But it's all Gene, and um, but that's one of the hardest scenes for me to watch because I met Gene in 1985, and that movie came out in 1980, and that's what he looked like to yeah. me. And so when he moves and when he gets up out of the chair and walks across the floor, I mean, walks isn't the right word. He just, 
he literally glides um, yeah. and that's the way he was in real life i mean yeah. just just going across our living room floor he he didn't walk it was just this movement that was so graceful and so that that one is a that scene is trickier for me than than say something that he did in the 1940s so. i know you mean because it's how you you know him isn't it it's in the you, you, it's like looking almost like he's in your lounge, if you like, you know, because he's so vivid. Exactly. Yeah. Well, listen, we, I'm, and I, that, we're, gonna, we're, we're running out of time. So we must do this again, Patricia, because you, you're such fun. Um, I want to just get in, though, the fact that you do take your show round and you were going to come to London, but now it's gone all whatever. Let's just leave it at that boring situation we're now all in. Terrible situation. But you will be bringing it back, hopefully, again at some point, maybe 2021? Absolutely. And uh, yes, and it's the big, I hope to bring the big live symphony show. It's 70 musicians on stage with wow. me and the conductors. So we there's no room for social distancing, but it's <laughs> the, the musicians play uh, the music live to the clips. And then I'm on stage and I weave the stories in between. And it's uh, we premiered it with the Royal Scottish National Orchestra in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and we went to Dublin last year, and we were set to be in London uh, with the London Philharmonic in March, and that's going to have to move uh, into the future, but yeah. it will get there for sure, because it's one thing that I love, London loves Jean. I mean, it's, I have a, I do this little thing where I have my card and I give it out to every cab driver and every cab driver that just like automatically responds often they start singing the songs and yeah. so he's he's very beloved there and i think uh it's a i really am eager to get back there and um and share a little bit more and i want to go see the statue in the in leicester square and kind of see people watching him and enjoying him there so yes let's do it again the minute minute i have a date we'll we'll reconnect absolutely and listen i go past the statue a lot so i always wave and say hello so don't worry he's never okay. alone patricia <laughs> <laughs> listen thank you so Perfect. much for today it's been absolutely lovely to speak to you we'll do it longer next time but do take care and let's hook up soon take care Thank you for including me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>